Hello everybody, this is uh, Paul with Fruitful Trees and I'm at this wonderful farm that I've been to before, Tropical Acres Farms. This is Alex. I'm used to seeing up on all these trees here. He, uh, this is an amazing place. I've been to many different mango farms and places and I haven't been to a place that has as many varieties of mangoes as this. And today we're going to be looking at many of these different varieties. Just some of them. We can't even come close. Uh, how long has this farm been here? Uh, the Sturrox bought this property in 1919, so over 100 years ago as of this year, over 100 years uh, this has been a farm or a nursery of some kind, and it's still uh, the land is still owned by the Sturrox family, and I lease it to them. And the oldest tree on the property is over 100, oh, over oh. 100. I think we've got a turpentine tree that might be from the 1800s, I think. Wow. Um, pretty massive trunk. And here they don't only have mangoes, they have other trees, but mango is the most common one here. They sell mangoes, they sell mango trees, they ship all over the country. And check out the link below for the information. So me and Alex are going to show you some of his farm and some of the trees right now. Well, on this farm we, we grow about 300 varieties of mangoes, actually more than that. I'm not sure the exact number these days, but um, it's taken a while to collect that many. But I'll show you some of the other trees in this section, I yeah. guess. Uh, so this, um, this whole section here, the whole row is Terry Mango. Terry is a super, super popular mango. Too popular for its own good, really. I mean, I get phone calls from people all over the country wanting to buy Terry Mango. They'll drive long distances to buy it. Really popular um, with the, uh, uh, the Indian population in the United States, people from India. Uh, love this mango. People from the Caribbean, from Jamaica, Trinidad, love this mango. And a lot of Americans really appreciate it. I don't know, Paul, you like Kerry, right? Yes, yeah. I okay. have a big one. Well, we, we've got a very, very big Kerry crop this year. If you look closely, um, these trees have a lot of mangoes on them. So, um, we're going to have a lot of Kerrys. Probably still not enough for everybody, but uh, we're, we're pretty impressed with how these have have been performing. We, we get good crops from these pretty much every year. We'll usually get multiple crops from them. Um, in fact, if you look up in the canopy, you can see some larger fruit there. That's from the uh, first bloom, um, like this. Right and here. there's some flowering so, up there. Yeah. yeah, and so these things, they, they never seem to stop flowering. We, we, we still got flowers coming out of them. And I guess the tree decided it didn't make enough mangoes, although I think it did pretty well. So. Um, This, this mango always fruits every year, really early for us. And it's actually a really nice, classically flavored mango, we call it. So it's got like stone fruit flavors like peach and nectarine and apricot kind of flavors. And uh, they do really great uh, for us here. And they're actually pretty manageable trees. These trees were planted in 2014, uh, same day uh, the rest of these were planted. And they've never had a hard prune. You know, we've done some tip pruning to shape them. But they've still got space between the, the um, you know, between the, the trees. Um, okay, so so anyway, the, the rosy gold trees. Uh, we've got some of them over here. We've got some in other parts of the property, um, and uh, we we like these trees a lot. Of all your varieties, I know you have a lot, mostly Edward from the old days. But of all the varieties on the farm, is Edward still the one that's the most? Edward is still really productive. Uh, for us and really popular for us. I'll show you. Let's just go look at one of our Edward trees. Um, we have a lot of them here. I think there's about 60 of them. 60 yeah, Edward trees, wow. Sturrox planted a lot of Edward. They were really fond of the Edward. Jack Sturrock, who, who owns the land, uh, it's still his favorite mango. And so, even though we've got, you know, all these other varieties, but, um, you know, there's kind of a, uh, a myth, I guess, that Edward trees do not bear well, that they're shy producers, but some of our trees would probably beg to differ. Uh, this is an Edward tree, and uh, it's doing pretty well, I'd say. <laughs> what do you think, Paul? I think it's great, but I think it shows uh, a testament of how you care for a tree, because it probably is a shy bear if you don't take care of it well, but you said when you got here, you gave it extra care, and then they started yeah, to come I, back. I mean, like, you can't just, like, ignore them and neglect them. Um, that's for sure. 
But uh, they, they do all right here in West Palm Beach. You know, I've seen other Edward trees in the area, and they're, they're not terrible fruiters. Uh, but then there's people who have a totally different experience with them. But certainly one of the most popular mangoes, really great cross-ethnic appeal. So it doesn't matter what part of the world people are from, the Edward mango is still popular with them. And I can't say that for all mangoes. Like some mangoes, like Namdok Mai, for example, are not popular with Indian customers. And some Indian mangoes are not popular with Americans or people from uh, East Asia. But the Edward is popular with everybody, and that's um, that's pretty great because uh, we now, have a lot of them. I remember years ago you cut back a lot of the Edwards because they were getting so big. Yeah. So how big is too big for a mango tree in your opinion? Uh, I think that if they're getting north, well, when we're planting them tight, you know, we don't want them to get over 15 feet tall. But like when they're big old trees like this, that's kind of out of the question anymore in terms of trying to keep them at that height. So 20 to 25 feet is more reasonable. Um, anything taller than that, and it's hard to reach anything with a picking pole. We have to use a machine to harvest these huge trees. So I don't recommend letting them get this tall, um, especially when they're growing near power lines. But um, you know, 20, 25 feet, an old tree, you can probably keep it reasonably in that size range. If you've been managing the tree from the time you planted it, you can keep them, most mango trees, around 15 feet or under. And there's even, and there's varieties that are dwarf or lower vigor that you can keep shorter than that. So most of the trees over here are under that height, still even after being planted in 2014, which at that point, this is like seven years ago, so. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. All right. So those were the ones that were multiple we planted. Now I know years ago when I came here you had planted a bunch over there sure. of the uh, newer varieties. Yeah, so like over here the idea was that we were going to plant every single tree was going to be a different variety. We ended up with duplicates because of mislabeling like I spoke about earlier. But So there's a few duplicates in this area that we call kind of the collection area. Um, but we, we tried to do it in alphabetical order. So on the very end of the orchard um, is the A's down to the... You know, this is like the end of the alphabet here. So for example, this is a Valencia Pride. Now Valencia Pride has a earned reputation as being kind of the bamboo of mango trees, one of the most vigorous mango trees there is. Normally Valencia Pride trees get very large very quickly. Within a few years of planting one, you have a very large tree. This tree uh, would have been planted in 2014. It was probably about two years old by that point. So this is about a nine-year-old Valencia Pride tree. It is the smallest nine-year-old Valencia Pride you will ever see. Uh, this tree is not very large, and um, you know it's maybe like eight feet tall or something like that at size point. And it makes lots of mangoes every year. It's kind of almost like a dwarf Valencia Pride. Don't ask me how because I have no idea why. But uh, we've been able to keep this tree small and productive. Um, Do you prune it a lot or is it just the way no, it grows? I mean, we've pruned it. We've certainly pruned this tree, but, um, you know, I wouldn't say we've pruned it a lot. Uh, you know, we haven't overfed it. I think that's a big part of it. If you give too much nitrogen fertilizer to these things, they get big quickly, and that's a mistake that a lot of backyard growers will make. You know, part of it is that our soil is really good for mangoes here, and it doesn't have a lot of nitrogen or, or uh, excess nutrients that's making them want to grow faster. So. Our soil drains very well, so there's not a lot of water retention. And um, so, if you got a, a graph from this tree or a, a, a scoring sign from this tree, right? Would it, that doesn't guarantee it's going to be a dwarf, does it? No, it doesn't. In fact, if you were to take budwood from this one, you pride and graft it somewhere else, most likely it would grow just as vigorously as the. Uh, you know, normal Valencia Pride would. There's, there's no, as far as I know, there's no genetic difference between this Valencia Pride and anything else. It just maybe has something to do with the rootstock, maybe has something to do with the location, I don't know, but we're kind of proud of this tree because it's managed to stay as small as it is and just super productive. I mean, I'm sure we'll get just dozens and dozens of fruit off of this tree this year. So, uh, really impressive tree. Great, great. Uh, so all your trees that you planted in alphabetical order here, we tried uh, to, yeah. You tried to, so, you know, a lot of times people would consider the type of variety in the season, depending on the spot where they plant them. But you didn't think about any of that in this area? You just no, went for straightly? No, it was just kind of as alphabetically ordered as possible um, when we planted these originally. Now what happened was, like I mentioned, we had varieties that were duplicates and we ended up um, removing some of those and replacing other trees we top work. This is a top work. Um, this is a top work here I did more recently. 
So this was a tree that uh, was a problem for us because of disease, and we decided to just turn it into something else, and we've done that quite a bit out here. So a lot of these are out of alphabetical order, um, you know, but that's okay at this point. I know where everything is. And yeah. So How much acres do you have here? This is just under eight acres of land. I guess it's um, seven and three quarters to be precise. And everybody that's watching, I'm going to put the address and the contact information below. During mango season, if you want to get mangoes, this is one of the best places you can buy them. They also do mail order, so check out the link below yeah, the video. We do, ship, we do ship fruit, and we're going to be shipping trees this year as well. So that's uh, an exciting new aspect of our business because we haven't shipped trees in a very long time, and we're going to be offering that this year in addition to fruit. So. Um, and we're also in the process of getting certified to ship trees to California, which requires oh, wow. a special certification, but we're in the process of getting that, and we hope to have that pretty soon. So if you're in California, even though we can't ship you ripe fruit, we might soon be able to ship you trees. So, um, so anyway, yeah, this section has a, a lot of different stuff uh, within it, a lot of different varieties. So I have a question about this section. I know over there you're going to show us you have a well and you have an irrigation system. I don't see that on the floor here unless it's underground. A lot of it's underground. We still have an irrigation system here. We don't like to water our trees a lot. And the reason is because here in Florida, we do get plenty of rain thrall through most of the year. This is our dry season, so right now we don't get a lot of rain. But um, as a part of trying to keep our trees at a manageable size, we don't want to water them a whole lot after they're young. Now we'll water the trees throughout the year when they're young, uh, but later on we'll restrict that uh, because we want to limit their growth so that they're not getting away from us too easily. So, um, but like I said, a lot of um, interesting things here um, that are fruiting really well. This mango here uh, is a mango from nurseryman Gary Zill. Um, he named this after his wife, Giselle. Uh, so this mango is named Giselle, and it is a uh, really really rich sweet decadently flavored indian flavored mango we say it's like an indian west indian flavor and uh, really pretty mango too uh, gary zill had described it to me as a juice mango which made me think it was going to have a lot of fiber but it's really not uh, very fibrous and uh, it's got a lot of fruit on it and uh, i've tried this mango before and it's it's so good uh, i'm excited to it's, you don't yeah. hear a lot about it though, it's not well known. It's not well known. A lot of the stuff we grow on this farm is not very well known, um, but a lot of it should be well known. At least we think it should be well known. And so um, we're hoping that we can popularize some of these varieties that are really exciting, but just people don't know that much about. I mean, there's so many mangoes out there already that it's easy to get confused or forget about certain mangoes. And so this year we're really going to try to emphasize some of the varieties that um, we feel, we hope that people will discover more of. And um, uh, fortunately, because I, I've got a lot of connections with the, the, the nursery trade and I've been doing this for a while, we've been able to collect a lot of different varieties. Uh, like I mentioned, Gary Zill, who um, uh, has done more for mangoes, I think, than probably any other individual um, you know, in the United States over the last couple of decades, uh, him and Richard Campbell. And so um, we've got a lot of varieties that he bred, he created, and we're testing them out here to see how they'll do because maybe they didn't do so great in one location or another, but they might do well for us here. Um, I'll show you another interesting mango, Paul. Uh, over here, this is a dwarf variety. It's an Indian mango. It's called Arganyokra. I don't Say the remember. name again. Arca Nilkron. It's from India. Okay. It was bred by India's National Breeding Project a long time ago. It is a dwarf tree. It has grown really slowly. I mean, really slowly. But it fruits every single year. It flowers prolifically, too. And you can see it's still trying to flower. It's not done yet. Here it is March 30th, and we still have flowers coming out of these. But um, this is a productive mango with an Alfonso class flavor. It's a cross between Alfonso and Ratna. Uh, from India, and uh, we're one of the only farms that's growing this mango, um, but we feel like other people should be growing this if they knew more about it. So, Arcanil Karan, we've been producing the trees for uh, a little bit. We've produced only a few of them. We're going to produce some more this year. 
but very interesting variety that hopefully some more people can trial out here uh, in Florida and maybe in other places too that they don't have a lot of yard space, they want a dwarf tree, and they don't just want to plant a pickering necessarily, although pickering is very good, but like if they want something with a different kind of flavor, there are other dwarf trees out there that you could potentially plant. And so we're, we're trialing some of those out. Um, Paul, you told me that you have a, uh, a white piri that, uh, or you had grafted, yes, right? Yes, okay. I have one as well. So white piri is a mango from Hawaii, and it's a delicious, this is also an Indian flavored mango, um, Indian West Indian, a lot of spice, a really rich, delicious fruit, and very popular. This is one of our white piri trees, as you can see, it has a very nice crop on it. Um, does pretty well over here and flowers pretty easily. These trees usually flower every year for us. And uh, this is a mango that people have been discovering and now is actually turning up in the Florida nursery trade a little bit, which is great. Now, people in Hawaii have known about this mango for a long time, but people in Florida uh, rarely had ever heard of it until recent times. And so we're glad to see that this is a variety that was unknown for a long time and now is starting to get popularized. And so we've uh, you know, been promoting this mango for a while, and now we're seeing people requesting it and uh, selling trees of it. So white period, uh, really good Indian flavored variety. You said something very interesting earlier. You said, uh, like they say about real estate with mango trees, location, location, location. Yeah. Yeah. So that means a lot, depending. And it doesn't mean that this one location is just bad. It's just different right. varieties grow in different locations. Yeah. So some varieties will thrive in a drier climate, and then you take them to a more humid climate might struggle or they might have to be sprayed a lot to get them to fruit well. And a lot of people don't do that obviously in Atlanta. So um, you know certain kinds will do better in, in Florida and coastal areas. Um, but then some varieties um, need more of uh, more cold weather to flower. And so some of them don't do so well in South Florida only because they don't flower that well in South Florida. But you take them to central or western Florida or you take them to Southern California. Uh, or some place like that where they get colder weather and they flower prolifically and they fruit well. So that's another factor with location that isn't related to disease pressures so much as their ability to flower in the first couple of places because you need flowers to get fruit. So, sure. so um, let's show some of the uh, other ones. Uh, This is Fruit Punch. This is one from Gary Zill also. Um, this is a pretty good mango, but we only planted one of it. And it's because we were a little fearful about it being prone to bacterial black spot. This year the fruit looked really clean. So um, So with the bacterial black spot, some years it could be, the tree could be loaded with it and other years yeah, could it be fine? Yeah, exactly. So some years are worse than others. Uh, and this is true all throughout the world where it occurs, but um, you know, it's not going to be the same every year, but when it does occur a lot, it's very destructive. And, uh, well, you already know about it, Paul. Yeah. So we've had to top work a lot of trees here that we felt were too prone to bacterial black spot. This is one that we had planted one of, and we didn't want to plant more because we were concerned about that disease with this fruit. We're going to see how it does this year. Uh, last few years, um, it's, you know, it's had a few fruit that rotted, but um, this will be a, an important year for this tree. Um, and whether we decide to add more of it or, or whatever or, or, you know. And we, you planted this in 2014 as well? This was actually planted, I think, in 2015. Okay. So, but not a super vigorous tree, um, but a really good mango. It just has kind of a brief period where it's exceptional. And some of the better mangoes, in my opinion, have kind of a longer window where they're really good. So this one, it's, it's a lot briefer. So um, talking about trees that are flowering, this is a dwarf Hawaiian. And we have about 30 dwarf Hawaiian trees on this farm, actually. We really like this variety because of its ability to fruit very easily. And it will flower usually at least three times. I've had dwarf Hawaiian trees flower four times. You can see it's setting fruit from its, I guess this is its third bloom. It's got fruit on it that are developing from its uh, first and second blooms. But um, every single year, we always get fruit from these trees. They're very reliable. and. Uh, a really popular mango and also a pretty dwarf tree. Um, not for all areas. I wouldn't think they're a great choice for like wetter climates, um, you know, but I can appreciate the fact that something flowers that, uh, you know, 
that easily. Um, is that enthusiastically, I guess, would be the right term for that. But. Now, on your website, I know you have all the different varieties that are or a good amount of the varieties of mangoes out there and a lot of information. Yeah. But do you have on your website the exact varieties you have here and how many of each tree? You know, we've got a list of every variety we grow here. We don't have the total numbers of every variety on there. Um, and that shifts every year because we're constantly adding stuff and taking some stuff out of production. So no, we don't have e uh, the number of every tree a lot of them we just have one of, uh, but there's some of them that, like the Dwarf Hawaiian, we have dozens of, so we love that tree. Now this is a glen here. We have two glen trees on this farm. This is the older of the two trees. This was planted in 2014. And, um, you know, this is a classically flavored Florida mango. A lot of Americans appreciate this fruit. For other uh, people, it might be a little on the mild side, but Glen's got like a kind of a peachy flavor to it. Most people would describe. A little bit of a short shelf life, but really uh, prolific trees. Uh, they make a lot of fruit. So, um, so in 2014, when you planted these trees, was there something else here in this area before that you took out? It was or? overgrown brush. I mean, okay. there was a Malaluca tree growing over here, I remember. There was Brazilian peppers, a few other things. So it was just brush pretty yeah, much. Yeah, for okay. the most part, it was just brush. Um, and then uh, Jack Sturrock had it all cleared. And, um, you know, we started planting. He had a lot of trees that he was collecting up in Jacksonville. I had a few trees that I was keeping at my nursery in Loxahatchee. And we just started planting them all uh, New Year's Day 2014. We planted a lot of trees that day. And then we continued to plant as the months went by and the years went by. So I'll show you a section of the orchard that's got some younger trees in it that were planted more recently. These are kind of trees that have gotten to the point where they're near full production. And, um, you know, most of them are doing pretty well. Um, so, this is a mango I really like. This is Cac, delicious uh, mango from Vietnam. I actually got one from you. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mango in a tree. <laughs> I, I, I like this tree a lot. It's a very aggressive tree, so I don't want to, like, sing all its praises. Um, they get very large, and they're not great for small yards or people that want to grow mangoes in, in a high-density situation. But um, if you've got a lot of space, uh, I, I love this mango. This is one of my favorite mangoes, and it's one of the most popular mangoes that we sell. Um, and I was talking about mangoes with good cross-ethnic appeal that a lot of people from around the world like. CAC is one of those. Uh, everybody loves this mango. It's very, very, very few people have ever told me that they're not a fan of this thing. So, um, yeah, these are, these are wonderful. Um, I really like them. Oh, uh, what else is there down here that, uh... Well, here's a kind of obscure mango um, that's not really grafted much in the nursery trade anymore, although we're producing this. This is called Dupuis Saigon. Uh, Walter Zill still grows this, um, but the Zill Nursery doesn't graft it anymore. Um, this is a mango originally from Miami, and it's a delicious early season mango, and I've noticed it's really resistant to mango bacterial black spot. Um, a vigorous tree also, uh, like the CAC, uh, so it's not a really great one for small yards, but it's a tree that would probably do really well in California where they've got uh, you know, a lot of trees growing really, really slowly and they prefer more vigorous types. So Dupuis Saigon, you know, if you're watching and you're in California or Arizona or something, this is one you might want to think about because this is a really good mango. Um, and uh, early season too. We get these as early as late April. Uh, or May most of the time. So it's, it's like a, it can be a spring mango. Sometimes it's into the summer. Uh, and it looks like we've got more than one crop on this one actually. So um, quite a bit of fruit up there. And the now summer. you could ship the tree to people in California. So that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> soon. Yeah, yeah that's great. Certification. But, um, so this is a mango that we've got from India. Um, well, it's, it was brought to the United States from India about 100 years ago, but uh, over 100 years ago. This is called Todapuri, and it's grown in India, especially in southern India, um, as like a mango that uh, is used for a number of different purposes, but they really like to eat this mango green in India. And so we sell this mango a lot to folks from southern India who adore this fruit as like a snack um, when it's green. And so they get very large, really productive tree makes huge fruit, huge fruit. Um, and so uh, this tree has gotten too big. I am gonna cut this back significantly this year. This is way taller than we normally allow our mango trees to get. 
but it's going to have a massive crop this year. We're excited about that. So this is Totapuri. Sometimes they call it Bangalora in India, but um, kind of an oblong shaped fruit and gets very, very large. This is another kind of um, hard to find mango in Florida. This is called Buxton Spice. Now this mango is originally from um, Guyana and we get a lot of people that uh, call us about this because they see it on our website. They're maybe they're from Guyana. It has a strong Indian flavor. And um, this, this mango, for whatever reason, is not very common in Florida, but ours has been fruiting for a few years and it's doing extremely well. You can see it's got a lot of fruit on it. Hasn't been too vigorous of a grower either. So um, just one of those uh, unusual, hard to find mangoes that uh, we're trialing out here. Um, what else we got? This is Emerald. So this is a mango that Richard Campbell and Fairchild were promoting for a brief period of time. I don't know, maybe like 10 years ago or something. This is like some kind of a Bombay seedling. Now Bombay trees normally get very large. Um, this tree has grown really slowly actually, um, but it's really productive um, and has a flavor pretty similar to the Indian or the Jamaican Bombay, Indian Pyre mango as it's called. And uh, it's doing really well and I don't know, I guess it's like seven feet tall or so. This is another Edward. So we did plant an Edward just out in the field to see how it would do when it was started from a three gallon tree. And doing really well, as you can see, there's a lot of fruit on this Edward tree. And uh, a lot of it's gonna be coming in May, I think, actually. Um, so we'll have a lot of Edward mangoes around that period of time. So that's very interesting. With all the space you got, you still want to use it as efficiently as possible, and you have over 60 Edward trees, but you still decide to plant yeah, one to, to learn. Edward, um, yeah, we still planted Edward, and there was a few that died that, that got replaced with new Edward trees, too. That was more recently, but um, this was one that we planted in that initial planting in 2014, and, I mean, doing great, uh, just really productive. I have to stake the fruit off of the ground because it, it ends up with a, a lot of fruit on it, and uh, we don't want it sitting on the ground, so... You stake them up. Do you have any issues here with raccoons? Yeah. Oh, we get raccoons, we get possums. Uh, a problem that's emerged the last few years is iguanas. Uh, we didn't have iguanas here until, I don't know, however many years ago we started noticing them, but they come in from Dreyer Park. So um, we used to get a lot of squirrels, but nowadays we don't because we took away a lot of the trees that bordered the periphery of the property. And if you do that, they don't like to travel on the ground. Squirrels much prefer to go tree by tree because when they're on the ground, they're vulnerable to hawks and eagles and stuff like that. So um, we've seen much less squirrels the last several years when, since we took away some of those trees that were bordering our neighbors in the park. And now they don't jump from tree to tree anymore as easily. So. Maybe that's why the iguanas like it here now. <laughs> yeah, no I guess so. Um, you know, we get a lot of iguanas that come in from the park. So. Um, if I can show you a few more interesting trees. This is one that Zill produced in his breeding project. And they grafted it, they still graft it a little bit. It's called Harvest Moon. It makes really large, massive fruits. I was always told that these were not good producing trees, but ours has actually done reasonably well. And you imagine these fruits get over three pounds, so you don't need too many of them to um, end up getting a lot of pounds of fruit off. So these usually come in like late July, and it's actually a really good mango. It's an Edward seedling, and um, you know, uh, doesn't it's kind of got more of a flavor closer to Ken, to my opinion. The shape is kind of like that too, um, but uh, it's done okay for us. So some of these ones that have a reputation for shy bearing, uh, like I said, don't always act that way. So um, I'll show you another one. Uh, has that so this mango, this is called Peach Cobbler. This is one of Gary Zill's creations also. The peach Cobbler um, is a very vigorous tree. Uh, probably better suited for California, honestly, or at least Central or West Florida. But, um, you know, it can fruit pretty well as long as it flowers. So that's the issue we've had with this tree the last few years is uh, getting full blooms from it, but it's going to have a, a huge crop this year. We're going to have a, a, a nice early crop on this tree and a nice second crop. The name's a little bit of a misnomer. You know, peach cobbler suggests it's really a peach flavored mango and it's not. It's more of a citrus flavored fruit um, and it kind of ripens really quickly too. 
Um, so that can be a downside to this, but it's one of the best of the new Zill uh, creations, in, in my opinion. It, it's, it's really, really flavorful. What tree of all your trees has been the biggest disappointment, the one you're most excited about, but it didn't pan out to be that as well? Biggest disappointment? Uh, probably Bombay, actually. Um, I was hoping Bombay was going to be more fruitful for us, and uh, it hasn't. We also planted a Mulgoba tree that has had good crops some years, but uh, most years it, it hasn't done that great. So those are some major disappointments in my opinion. Coconut cream I think has been kind of a disappointment. This year we don't have a lot of fruit on those. Um, we've had some good crops on it, but uh, that, one, that one's been disappointing out of uh, some of the ones that we were really excited about. Fortunately, there's lots of alternatives for these, and when you've got 300 varieties, it's kind of the next man up kind of thing. Um, this here is uh, a rosa mango, roses from Brazil. And this is an interesting fruit because it fruits extremely early here. It can come as early as, uh, I guess as early as March some years, um, but a lot of times it'll have fruit ready in April. This one really likes to flower. This is one of the most enthusiastic flowering mango trees there is. And um, it's, uh, it's got uh, a lot of mangoes on it from its first bloom, actually. But you can see it's still got flowers coming out of it. It did have a second bloom, so it's got some smaller fruit on it as well. Um, people in uh, Brazil call this mango rosa. That's how they pronounce it. And they love this fruit. Um, I've got Brazilian customers that have come here just for this mango or, or they ordered it in the mail and um, they, they, uh, they like it a lot. And um, it's kind of a dwarf tree. Actually, this tree was planted, uh, I think in 2014, maybe not New Year's Day, but around that time is a three gallon. It's grown really slowly. We have two others I can show you that are really small as well that were planted only slightly more recently. This was a, a Raposa mango tree, and we decided to top work it over into a rosy gold on this side. And the rosy gold part of it's already bearing. I think I top worked this like less than two years ago. Uh, but it shows you just how prolific rosy gold can be. Uh, you top work a tree, and you might not expect it to start fruiting for a little while, but this one's already going uh, real quick. Um, this here is uh, a pineapple plant. Pineapple Pleasure is a variety that was selected by Gary Zill as well. And this is just an unbelievably good, uniquely flavored mango. Um, and certainly one amongst the most popular we grow amongst people who've tried it. Uh, not a lot of people have. Uh, and I'm not sure how much this has been grafted in the nursery trade, but um, you know the Zill Nursery still makes it, I think. And uh, we're going to be grafting some this year too. i got to prop these up. Uh, this is a productive tree, and it makes very large fruit, um, you know, over two pounds in size in a lot of cases. And we've had a lot of success with it. We actually have several of these trees on the farm. And uh, um, we actually just recently top worked another tree into Pineapple Pleasure. We like it so much, and I think we planted a couple of them too uh, as three gallon trees recently. So we love yeah. Pineapple Pleasure. Pineapple Pleasure is just an awesome, awesome mango uh, from, uh, from Gary Zill's project. It is a seedling of the Springfells mango, which is an old Florida variety that people didn't like too much. But he crossed it with Gary. And uh, the cross is just an amazing result. Um, and uh, not the prettiest fruit in the world, per se, but the, the eating quality on this is outrageously good. Definitely one of the best ones that, that Gary Zill bred. And uh, I just, I, I'm in love with this mango. It's I so, think some so people good. say, I think on your website you said it produces well here, but other people have a problem with it producing. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've had good results with this mango. So, um, some people have had, uh, you know, um, less than optimal results, I guess, with pineapple pleasure. I think it's probably not a great choice for humid areas because it will probably be a little too fungal prone there. But there's got to be areas where it does well because clearly it does well here. So, um, so anyway, I, 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 I really uh, like this tree and I wouldn't be surprised if I add even more of the ones that, to the ones that we already have. So um, Pineapple Pleasure, um, really a great tree. Not, very, not super vigorous either. I mean, this tree got planted in 2015, Paul, so it's not, not a monster by any stretch. Um, 
you know, definitely manageable, I think. Speaking of that, I see this tree very close by. Yeah, so this so. is an interplanted tree. This is a rosy gold. And the rosy gold has lots of fruit on it. Um, and this might be the last year this tree is going to be in this spot until we either move it or we sell the, the, uh, the tree. But um, uh, this was an area where we were planting a lot of them in the higher density. And at this point, the trees around them are starting to grow into each other. So Now, when I'm, you move it and sell it, what would you do? You'd root prune it and then... Yeah, either that or if we dig it out right away, we would hack the tree back pretty significantly before digging it out. And then we might put it in a container. Uh, for a period of months and water it very frequently until it recovers. And we've done that quite a few times. And in oh, fact, really? some of these trees were moved from my farm in Loxahatchee. This was one of them. So, and uh, so was this little So how'd you do that? Them. You put a, you, you would root prune it and then put it in a container, you said? Uh, those weren't root pruned. Those were actually dug up on the same day and they were pruned back pretty significantly. So okay. Some of them weren't very big. But some of them had decent size. But even if you root prune, you should trim it back, right? I think you should, yeah. 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 I mean, although root pruning is going to create less shock effect when the tree is taken out of the ground. So cool. root pruning, you need to plan ahead to yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, so what else I got over here that's kind of interesting? Um, this is a piva mango. This is kind of a cool variety because it's known to dwarf as a rootstock. When this fruit is used as a rootstock, it dwarfs a lot of the Florida mango varieties. Uh, it's been it's actually from south africa originally it's a dwarf tree itself we've had this in the ground since 2015. it always fruits a lot it makes a lot of mangoes for us and uh, we've been using it as an experimental rootstock um, and um, there's actually people that are ordering trees from us to be grafted onto piva so we do offer that service to people that are wanting their trees grafted to a dwarfing rootstock now it won't dwarf everything it will dwarf a number of varieties but I can't speak to every single one of those um, but definitely a dwarf tree and a really beautiful mango uh, kind of classically flavored fruit they look like grapes hanging from the tree yeah. like this but um, it's like red and purple <laughs> yeah um, so, um, uh, what else do I have over here that's kind of interesting uh, this is an old uh, this so these are pickering fruits that I transplanted from the Pickering, okay. Yeah, pickerings, you know, they're, they're sure. dwarf trees and uh, good for tight spaces. So these always fruit really well. And popular mango. This tree behind it, however, this is a Chino mango. This is from, uh, actually from Western Cuba originally. And we planted this mango thinking it was going to be maybe not that great because we didn't have great experiences with the other Cuban varieties we had tried up to that point. And this turned out to be a really, really delicious mango. Um, tastes similar to like Bailey's Marvel, if you've had Bailey's Marvel. It's a classically flavored mango, but a very sweet, classically flavored mango. And we, we've been impressed with it. I'm excited to have a, you know, a good crop on this this year, and hopefully lots of people will get to try Chino, because it's, it's really good. Um, another mango is over here that we've got um, that are fruiting pretty well. This is called Miatronaut. This is from Burma. This was brought over from Burma, I believe, by Maurice Kong. To Florida back in the, maybe the 90s or something and has a pretty good reputation um, and um, it's fruiting um, well pretty much the whole tree is fruiting it's covered in fruit so we'll have a lot of miatronaut it's not a very big mango it's kind of yellow it's got uh, Indo Chinese flavor this mango right here Paul um, that gentleman that was here earlier getting that tree uh, this is a mango called Maya and that's the tree he was getting Maya is a mango from Israel, and this, in my opinion, is the best of the Israeli mangoes. Um, I'm not sure what it was a seedling of, but it is a beautiful fruit. It looks kind of like Hayden, way better tasting mango than Hayden, though. And it's like I mentioned, the Chino was kind of like Bailey's Marvel-ish. This is in that category, too. Bailey's Marvel, Spirit of 76, those really sweet, delicious, classically flavored mangoes from Florida. This is like that, and it's really productive. and. Um, we're going to get a lot of fruit off of this Maya tree this year, and uh, I like this mango a lot, but it's not grafted in the Florida nursery trade, so it's hard to find. Uh, we might produce some of these this year if enough people ask for them. Uh, there is some information on Maya on our website if you want to read more about it, but um, I hope a lot of people get to try Maya this year because really good, really good tasting mango. It looks like maybe a little vigorous of a tree, but I think this was planted in 2015. How do you spell a, that? M-A-Y-A. And it's, from, it's from Israel originally, so, um, so uh, 
In this section, we do have some mame sapote trees growing. Um, we grow about 18 different kinds of mame now. We like mame a lot, um, and it can do very well in our climate here, so we decided to collect some different varieties of mame. One of them is fruiting now. They take a little bit longer than mangoes to fruit. That's not unusual. Um, but at some point, someday, you'll be able to get a lot of meme varieties from us. We do sell the budwood for meme sapote, and we plan to graft some meme this year as well in our nursery. Um, we also grow about, I don't know, maybe a dozen different kinds of sapodilla. And we have a couple very large producing sapodilla trees on this farm also. But here we interplanted our mangoes with our sapodillas and memes, so we've, we're using that space pretty well. Too. Now, in terms of interplanting them, I know some people plant them all together in groups for watering purposes. Uh, irrigation purposes. Yeah, and ideally we probably would have done that as well, but you know, we had limited space, so, but yeah, it, I would usually recommend that they're on different schedules. Now, speaking of space, uh, is all your space used or do you still have a lot more space? No, we left still there? have some space. We're not uh, totally done. We've got a little bit of space left here. We're going to be judicious about how we use it, uh, and some of it's going to have to be devoted to nursery production because. We have a lot of demand for our trees and we need to use that space wisely um, and make, them, make sure we've got enough for our potted fruit trees for, that we're going to sell to the public. But we do have a little bit more space here that we can devote to new plantings that we're conserving. And um, I'm sure new stuff comes up all the time every year and there might be stuff that we decide we want more of. I mentioned Pineapple Pleasure was one that we might plant more of, but there's other stuff that I'm sure I'll be thinking about in the future. And, uh, some of this stuff I'll show you now, you know, is, is still kind of new to us, but we might end up planting more of it if it continues to do well for us. Okay, now this space here with the spacing and we know that the advantage of planting them in groups together, the watering and so on, but somebody had mentioned uh, if you plant everything together, then the things fight for the, the root space and the nutrients if you have different yeah, things together. Yeah, that can together. happen if you overplant an area and especially if your soil is maybe a little nutrient poor. Um, but really the issue is, in a lot of those cases, is sunlight. Um, they're going to fight for sunlight and it's going to limit airflow. So you want, in my opinion, you want a lot of airflow. But a lot of people who have only so much space want to throw everything in there that they can. And so there's advantages and disadvantages of, of grouping every variety together. Yeah, I mean, together. like I said, this is not permanent. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So don't think that it is. Uh, other people might try it, but but for somebody with a small yard, it might be. I mean, it's, yeah, it depends, right? Yeah, I mean, right? they could try it permanently and see how much fruit they get. And, you know, for a family, you don't need as much fruit production out of each tree compared to a farmer whose income is dependent on that production. So I look at it through the prism of, of, of a commercial mango grower, but somebody else might just be happy with a little bit of fruit from every type of tree that they've got, and that's fine. So. Right. So, question about the mame, the, yeah. the new pumpkin mame. The, pumpkin the, pie. Do you have that? I, we planted one and it got killed actually, so uh, well, we're going to have to plant another one because I've heard really good things about that. Gary Zill told me about that. I think he brought it from Costa Rica. Um, and uh, That's supposed I, to be a dwarf tree, right? Or you don't know? I don't know. But I'm not sure actually. Yeah, people I don't have mentioned that to make me. Make a comment yeah. on that and then, and then. I don't know um, if it is. People mention it to me, but when I call Zill's up, they're like, oh, well, we don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you don't, maybe it did perform that way in Central America, but then you bring it here and it might not perform that way. It might be more aggressive. So you don't know what something will do in another climate. And uh, I don't know enough about okay. that to comment, uh, but we're going to certainly try to grow we're it. We're going to find out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we've got one called Viejo that's grown very slowly. Yeah. That's uh, also a meme that comes in the winter. We have some fruit on that now, actually, and I've eaten a few of them uh, already this year uh, when there's no other memes in season. So that's kind of cool. We're also growing some green sapote. Green sapote is a mame relative in the Pauteria family, and that fruits in Florida in the winter time. So we're trying to be able to get fruit from our mame and mame relatives almost all year long. You know, you can kind of yes. do that if you plant enough yeah. of them. So I love mame. It's one of my favorite fruits. Absolutely. So. Mine too. So now the sapodillas that are here, do you have any of the new butterscotch variety? or have We you planted heard? one butterscotch tree, and uh, maybe not in the most ideal location for it, but we did plant one, and I've had that fruit. That's a very good sapodilla, nice size fruit. This is one called Gigantia that's from Zill. We've already harvested most of the fruit off of this tree, and they're not very large because we had so much fruit on it, it kind of limited the size of the, the sapodilla that came off of this. But uh, this is a really nice sapodilla um, that, uh, that Zill introduced, actually. 
and um, it's already producing for us, been producing for a couple of years. So. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, this is called Mapu Lehi. Now, we got this as a mislabeled tree uh, a number of years ago from a nursery in Hawaii. It was supposed to be an XL mango, and um, it turned out to be mislabeled, and I, the only reason I knew that is because I had made a trip to Hawaii a long time ago, back in 2010, and I had tried Mapu Lehu in Hawaii, and I recognized it. And, you know, comparing it to photographs, I knew immediately what it was. So, uh, Mapu Lehu is a Indian, West Indian flavored mango, and um, this tree started fruiting for us like the second year it was in the ground or maybe the first year it was in the ground, I don't remember. We had it growing in a pot for like a year or two before we planted it. We, we received it as a one gallon plant, I believe. And so this got planted in 2017 and it's been fruiting almost every year since. And it loves to flower. In fact, it's still flowering. This tree hasn't stopped yet. We've still got flowers coming out of this tree. And um, it's productive, it's got a really long shelf life, and it's a very nice flavored mango. It has to get on the riper side before it achieves its full flavor. But this is a mango that nobody in the Florida nursery trade that I'm aware of grafts. And so we decided to produce some because it hasn't grown very vigorously. We thought this tree was going to be a real vigorous mango, but it's not. Um, and it's been precocious, and it flowers even when the weather is hot. Uh, it's been flowering and just seems to want to make fruit no matter what. So we like Mapu Lehu a lot and I hope some other people will try growing it here because um, it's, uh, it's a good Indian, West Indian flavored mango. It's a pretty fruit too. Um, it's nice and firm but it's not a fibrous fruit it, but it's got a firm flesh so it doesn't bruise easily. And um, so cool mango, Mapu Lehu. Keep that one in mind. We have a little bit of information about it on our website. So, um, show you some other stuff over here. This is pina colada. We have actually a number of pina colada trees on this farm, and um, it does pretty well. Um, this is like one of the sweetest mangoes I've ever had, and um, it's not a very big fruit. Pina coladas come out kind of small, uh, but they've got a long shelf life exceptionally sweet. I mean, these are real like flavor bomb mangoes, you know? Uh, some people they might be a little too much for. Actually, I once got sick eating these. I ate too many pina coladas in one sitting once and I had a stomach ache, but um, they're not too aggressive. Actually, they've been kind of moderately to low vigor trees. So, but they all got a lot of fruit on them. Um, and we have a, a few of them here. Um, this tree right next to it, this has a huge crop on it. This is called just, uh, um, this is called um, Galor. This mango supposedly is from Egypt. And this is a really nice oblong shaped fruit. Uh, kind of a spreading growth habit you can see. But a uh, really productive looking tree. It's not propagated in the Florida nursery trade. Um, and so uh, we've been growing it for a few years and it's fruited pretty much every year for us. So. This is another one that uh, I think people should try. Right next to it's another pina colada tree, doing pretty well. That's and the best mango that I haven't tasted yet. I got oh, two really? of them, okay, yeah, but I hear they're it. amazing. Um, yeah, they're, they're awesome. Um, really good mangoes. This one's called Herbie. So we got this mango, Herbie, um, from uh, David Bird down in Naples. David Bird is a mango enthusiast. Um, him and his wife, uh, Jenny, uh, they, um, they, they collect mangoes and introduce new ones from people's yards and stuff. Kind of a cool mango hobbyist down there uh, in Naples area. And so this one called Herbie, I'm not sure where this came from, but it's a really delicious fruit and I have trouble describing the flavor. I'm not sure whether it's classically flavored or Indo-Chinese flavored because I've eaten it before, but um, not enough of them to say, you know. But this year I'll, I'll be getting a lot of fruit from Herbie and hopefully other people will get to try it because we did graft some Herbie trees and um, it looks like it's productive. I think it's done well for the birds, so uh, might be another one that's worth trialing out in Florida. Well, another pina colada here. This has uh, a lot of fruit on it. Um, this is another interesting mango. This is called Ambika. So this was bred by India's National Breeding Program, and I think it's named after like a um, a goddess in Jainism or something like that, but um, it's a beautiful mango. 
kind of decent size and it came kind of late last year. We had a lot of these in like August last year when a lot of the mangoes were pretty much through. And really popular, it's a classically flavored mango with a lot of stone fruit in it. A lot of stone fruit flavor in this mango. Uh, maybe with a hint of melon too. Um, so really nice uh, mango from India, but not what we call Indian flavored, more of a classic, um, like a Florida type mango flavor, but really good quality. Um, not being grafted by anyone that I'm aware of. We did make a few of them. Um, I think it's worth trialing this out. We're kind of watching this one for a uh, bacterial spot because we did have a few fruit rot on this tree last year, but we had most of the crop was intact, so that was encouraging to see. Uh, this is another kind of unique one. This is from Gary Zill. It's called Carla. And um, this is a really good, what we call classic sub-acid mango. So there's the classic group, and then there's the sub classic sub-acid group. That's mangoes descended from like Zill 80 and 10. Those are, are mangoes that have the classic flavor notes, but they have more of a sub-acid zing to them. Um, fruit punch would probably qualify as that kind of flavor. Uh, certainly Zill 80 and uh, some others as well. This to me is a classic sub-acid mango. And it's kind of a mid-season, July to August uh, season fruit. And we should have a lot of them. I have, uh, I have two crops on this tree, and uh, I have a nice crop on my backyard tree. Um, I did plant one in my backyard in Palm Springs, and that one is doing pretty good too. So uh, hopefully we'll have plenty of Carla's for people to try this year. We are producing Carla trees as well. Um, I'll show you some interesting ones down here. This is a ladies' choice mango. So this mango is starting to get popular in the last few years. This was one of Gary Zill's uh, projects. It is a seedling of the East Indian mango from Jamaica. Now people from Jamaica love the East Indian mango, but unfortunately it tends to struggle here in Florida. This mango uh, produces much better than East Indian does, and it has much less fiber than East Indian. You can slice this mango. It has a little bit of fiber, but nothing ridiculous. And uh, not a huge mango but a really productive tree. And um, so this is one that we didn't graft a lot of this because we're not sure how it's gonna fare with bacterial black spot. East Indian is very prone to bacterial spot. So we're not sure how this one will fare in the long run, but, um, cause we have had some of the fruit get bacterial spot on this tree, but it hasn't wiped it out. So we'll see how it fares this year, but it's been a productive tree for us for several years and really popular with anybody that likes those deep, rich West Indian flavored fruits. Um, this is a little gem tree. Little gem is an impressive um, later season mango, kind of like a July, August mango. And uh, the issue has been with a lot of those July, August mangoes like Kent and Kit is that, um, and, and um, you know, Hatcher and what's the other one, Beverly, they're all kind of prone to bacterial spot and rot. This mango, is resistant, as far as we can tell, to that disease, and fruits very well. It is a uh, Indian West Indian flavor, really good um, Indian flavored mango, and um, so we have a few of these on this farm. We have a few that are grafted to dwarfing rootstocks that were provided to us by Gary Zill, and that seems to make them even more precocious um, and dwarf-like. Obviously, this doesn't really appear to be a dwarf tree, but it is kind of a dense canopy tree. So um, this is one that I'm thinking about maybe planting more up. Now I got one of these because of you, because oh, okay. you recommended that if you don't have a lot of space, this is one of the trees to have. Yeah, I think that uh, if you have only space for a few trees, you ought to think about stretching your season out. And when there's not a lot of late season options these days that are disease resistant, this looks really good to me. And I like the mango a lot personally. And our customers that have tried it have liked it a lot. So that's, that's really positive, you know, so. Um, okay, what else? Um, one of the mangoes that we planted a lot of here is honey kiss. Honey kiss trees are very compact, late season. I would call them classically flavored and uh, really productive trees. Um, sometimes I think they have to too much fruit actually and it kind of limits the size of the mangoes. But um, not really aggressive growers and probably good for small spaces. So, uh, but uh, we like this one a lot. It's got a really nice flavor. It's resistant to bacterial spot, which I love. So, um, and uh, we've had a lot of people requesting honey kiss the last few years. So we'll have a nice supply of honey kiss fruit for anybody who wants to try this mango this year. Um, you know, contact us because I think we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, having it available in a lot of our boxes and stuff like that. So and this is called Winters. 
And this mango is beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful mangoes we grow, I think. Um, bright red color, and it's got an Indo-Chinese hybrid flavor. Um, so, um, you know, if you like mangoes like Venus or Fairchild or Duncan or something like that, it's in that wheelhouse, so to speak. And um, it's not really being produced as far as I know. Old, old variety from, uh, I think from the USDA um, back in the 50s or something. I think it's a seedling of Glen, but it does not taste like Glen, okay? It's a different mango called Winters. We'll have that available this year. And I'm gonna show you the Super Alfonso. Where in between the original Duncan mango tree, which is this thing here, and another Duncan, but this part of the tree is Super Alfonso, and it's got fruit on it, up here, inside here. Um, I think this is a really good mango, but it doesn't taste anything like Alfonso. So I don't like the name. <laughs> it was originally Zill 368 was the number, and then it got named India or Indira or something like that. And they might have called it something else, too, at some point in time. But um, anyway, its name has changed hands quite a few times. Really good mango, kind of a mid-season. Um, it produces really well at Gary Zills. I'm sure ours would be more productive if it weren't totally shaded out. Um, but um, a little bit finicky about when it's picked. Uh, if you let this tree ripen, it's terrible. Um, if you pick it and it ripens within like five to seven days, it's really good. I've had a few that got picked way too green and they weren't you know, that good. So like, it, it's, it's finicky about when it's picked. So um, I'm waiting to see how resistant it is to bacterial black spot. And if it's resistant to bacterial black spot, I'll graft more of it. But until then, um, I'm a little bit hesitant because it is a seedling of Zill 80. Zill 80 is prone to bacterial spot and so is that line of mangoes. So we're monitoring this still. And plus half the tree is a different kind of mango. So okay, tell us about that, because this is one of those it's experimental one of those trees. <laughs> trees. So the other half of the tree, which has a little bit of fruit up in there, um, actually it looks like it decided to flower again. The other half of the tree is called uh, Zill 23-2. It doesn't even have a proper name. Um, that is a, uh, I think this is it here. This is a hybrid of Kit and, um, and Gary like the uh, Zill M4. And um, we tried this for the first time last year and weren't very impressed, but it was the first fruit we had gotten off of this tree. So we're interested in these Kit Gary crosses for a very specific reason. We don't have a lot of late season mangoes that are resistant to bacterial black spot. And the Gary is resistant, and we're hoping it confers genes onto those mangoes uh, that will make it resistant. So uh, Pineapple Pleasure, for example, is a Springfell seedling. Springfells is horribly prone to rot and bacterial spot, but um, Pineapple Pleasure is a cross between Springfells and Gary and it doesn't get those diseases. So, and we've seen that in other Zill mangoes too, um, that are crossed with the Gary uh, and their other parent uh, may have been a, a variety that was prone to the disease. So that's why we're testing these out. We, one of the reasons why we're testing them out, we want to see how they're going to perform against bacterial black spot without spraying them with anything to control it. So, um, sure, tell us about this tree. So, was this an older tree and this you put was two a new ones on? This tree that David Sturrock used to breed mangoes here, and so he planted a lot of seedlings here on this property back in the 50s and 60s. This was one of those seedlings that was still growing here when we started planting more trees, and some of them Jack Sturrock um, just decided to just cut down because they were just way too close to some of the other trees. But some of them um, we decided to maintain the stumps and top work them and put different stuff on them. Or, you know, and that's an case, example right yeah, there. Yeah, this is an example. I put two varieties on here. I put the Zill 368, which is the Super Alfonso, and I put the uh, Zill 232, which is that Kit Gary cross. And I've gotten fruit from both of them, and we're still evaluating them. And this stump is in a very poor spot, okay? So it's not the best. Um, example of how these now knowing you had space to plant these in the ground by themselves what made you decide to try them like this uh we didn't have three gallon trees available of these uh to us in the nursery trade uh, i got these from gary zill and so um i just to accelerate the process of evaluating them 
because um, some of these varieties he only had one tree of and it was a seedling so it was like you know how is it going to do as a grafted tree on a on a stock or an inner stock so we just we got the budwood and we threw it on whatever we could at the time and so at the time this stump was available and we put it on this i wish i had put it on something else probably i'll plant out some of these or one of these at least somewhere else eventually as long as they don't get bacterial black sure. spot too bad sure. um so this is one these are both top work stumps and this one over here is a cotton candy mango and cotton candy is one of the best of gary zill's selections cotton candy is a really really rich classically flavored mango it tastes like it's like if you took honey kiss which is already a sweet mango and made it even sweeter um that's that's cotton candy cotton candy is a nice size mango it's a kit crossed probably with gary um and it looks really productive i mean this tree's gonna have a lot of fruit it's flowering more actually strangely enough so it's not done yet i guess we have a number of cotton candy trees on this farm. I think like seven or eight or nine of them. I don't remember. I have one in my backyard also in Palm Springs. So uh, we'll have a lot of cotton candy this year, I think. Um, and uh, definitely a mango a lot of people should try. We're waiting to see whether it's worth planting. We did get bacterial spot on them last year, which is discouraging. We'll see how they handle it this year. Um, but cotton candy, one of the best of Gary Zill's creations and uh, one that we'll have uh, more of this year than we had in front Orange sherbet. You've heard of this one. Oh right? yeah, orange sherbet. Yeah. Look at that. Wow, and that's our root, that's on a that's top, on the top work. work. Yeah, yeah. Actually, half of the tree, or now less than half of the tree, is a mango, an Indian mango called um, Cervana Rica or some dairy. That's going to have some fruit too, but the orange sherbet's going to have. How many fruit. do you have of those? Orange sherbet? Yeah. Uh, like eight or nine of them or wow. something. Wow. Now, orange sherbet versus orange essence. What do you think? Uh, different kind of citrus flavor. Orange sherbet is the Burmese citrus, as we call it. Um, orange essence is the Gary citrus. So orange essence is a cross between Kent and Gary, I think, is the speculation. And so there is a difference in that citrus profile. Seacrest is also a citrus flavored mango of the Gary line. Orange sherbet is more similar to something like lemon zest or lemon meringue. Um, that that has that citrus flavor. Malika also has that citrus flavor, even though it's from India. This is Mekong. Mekong. Yeah, Look at that big tree. Mango that's very unique. Um, it is a hybrid between Edward and Philippine, and it's got a very uh, interesting flavor and aroma. It's like an Indo-Chinese hybrid flavor, but it's got a resinous component to it that most mangoes from that part of the world don't have, like almost like an Indian flavor in there somewhere, some terpenes that you would expect to find in, in Indian mangoes. So it's been a really popular mango. Um, we have people that will order whole boxes of this thing, and uh, it's going to have so much fruit. This year. How old is this tree? This is probably a 60-something-year-old tree now. And... Um, you can actually see the original graft star on it. See the, this area right here. Wow. I believe is where the graft union was done. Wow. Yeah. So. What's it, how do you spell it? Mekong. M-E-K-O-N-G. And uh, that's a big tree. Now, as the, how tall would you say this tree is? Over 40 feet. So from a uh, height wise, the very top of it. Yeah, are you gonna? Harvest, are you, I can get up pretty high. But are you gonna be shortening it at some point? Someday, yeah, but hopefully not anytime soon. <laughs> I get so much fruit from it. It's crazy. It's also resistant to bacterial spots. Oh, nice. So. Oh, okay. So this is a sugar loaf mango. This is also one of Gary Zill's creations, a Edward seedling. Actually, a lot of Gary Zill's newer selections were. Uh, seedlings of the Edward mango and Sugarloaf is one. Sugarloaf is probably a cross between the Edward and I think the Pettigrew is what Gary had uh, speculated was the uh, paternal parent. And this, in my opinion, is one of Gary Zill's best mangoes. The, the Sugarloaf has been um, really consistent in terms of being a great mango year after year. It has a very pronounced coconut flavor. The name Sugarloaf comes from the Sugarloaf pineapple, of course, 
Uh, and there is a little bit of pineapple component to this mango when it's on the less ripe side, but as it gets riper, the coconut really stands out on this mango. This mango is much better than coconut cream, in my opinion. Um, it doesn't always, ripe, well, it doesn't really ripen evenly. That's the funny part. Most mangoes that ripen unevenly don't taste very good in at least part of the fruit. This one tastes good in all parts of the fruit, including the middle and the, and the, the periphery um, and the area around the seed. They just might taste a little bit different from one another. So it's been a super popular mango for the last several years. And um, this is one of a number of sugarloaf trees we have. Um, and um, it looks like it'll be a fair producer. Um, I, I've got a few at my house too, actually, some small ones. We have a couple top worked ones also. And I think this is gonna be a, a you know, certainly a, a perfectly fine, uh, one of the exciting new varieties, and we'll have some of that fruit this year for sure. We've got quite a few sugarloaf trees, a number of which are bigger than this one, but, um, so, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I get asked a lot, what's your favorite mango? And a lot of people will just cop out and say the one in my hand or something like that, or I love all of them. My favorite mango is the sweet tart. My favorite mango is the sweet tart. And uh, to me, it's just an outrageously delicious, sweet, complex fruit that can be eaten at multiple stages and still be delicious. Um, I love it. I really love it. And year after year, I've enjoyed them. I, I don't know if I've ever had a bad one. Um, you know, and so I love the fruit so much and I just wish the trees had performed a little better over time. I think they're better suited for California or maybe the west coast of Florida. They'll probably fruit a little more consistently there. Um, and I don't know for sure how it's going to handle bacterial black spot in the long run because I don't feel we've we've got about 30 of them and a lot of them are fruiting well this year but over the years they've you know been uh, not so consistent about fruit production so uh, we'll have a lot of sweet tart this year which is great because our, cus our customers are going to get to try sweet tart on a much larger scale than they have in the past a lot of our customers have already had it before but uh, hopefully more than we'll get to try them in our variety boxes or at our fruit stand this year because um, we should have hundreds of pounds of it this year. What year did you plant this particular tree? You know this was growing at my farm in Loxahatchee originally and it was transplanted. Most of the sweet tart trees were transplanted from my farm in Loxahatchee back in 2016 or 17. So this has been in the ground a few years as a transplanted tree. It might have, you know, in Loxahatchee, they did okay. They fruited out there and they didn't have anthracnose problems, which is great. It's resistant to anthracnose. We know that. But the, the issues have been with flowering. And, um, you know, some people apparently have had problems with bacterial spots. But we'll have a lot of these this year. Awesome. All right, everybody, there it was. That was this uh, part of this amazing farm. We'll come back again and do some more. It's just about mango season. If you're in the West Palm Beach area looking for some mangoes, definitely you want to get out here. The link's below the video. And definitely you could also order them through the mail, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. Anything else you want to share today? Um, well, thanks for coming out, Paul. Um, it's been a while since we've done a video here, but the place has grown a lot since then. You can probably see the old video uh, in, in Paul's channel. But um, we really look forward to this mango season in 2021. It's gonna be a spectacular year. We're gonna have a lot of rare and interesting and unique varieties of mangoes available this year and a lot of different kinds of trees as well and bugwood. So check us out, please. Um, we're at tropicalacresfarms.com is our website. And you can find us on social media at Tropical Acres Farms on Instagram and Facebook. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. All right, everybody, uh, check out the link below to see all that and also the links to the previous videos I did with him here. And I'm going to be a lot here this summer, but you definitely want to contact them. So thank you very much for having me and keep growing, everybody. I think this is going to be a, a you know certainly a, a perfectly fine 